All right, so for chapter three, we're mostly going to be focused on um, sort of evolution, something that if you've taken a biology class before, you may have talked about. Um, and then we'll be mixing in uh, some other things as well as we go through. Um, and I wanted to start with just some of these pictures here, because when we're thinking about evolution, we're going to be starting by just thinking about adaptations. Um, and ultimately, that's what's led to all of the, the different organisms that are currently on the planet. So this is kind of a grainy image, but you can see polar bear at the bottom, which doesn't really make sense because it should be at the, the North Pole. Uh, but we've also got dolphins, we've got plants, we've got a whole bunch of different organisms. And then this one also kind of grainy, but we've got a polar bear um, hugging a cactus. So two organisms that would um, would have, ad have adapted for two completely different uh, environments. So we're going to see that the environment that uh, the organism lives in is going to be very um, impactful in terms of what that organism sort of looks like and how it behaves. Um, and when we're thinking about adaptation, this is just referring to the, the acquisition of advantageous traits. So these are going to be when an um, organism adapts, it's so that it can better survive in that environment. Um, and sometimes this can get a little bit tricky because uh, it's a very similar concept to what we've got here, acclimation. Acclimation is more of on an individual scale. So that can happen relatively short periods. So if you think about um, if you've ever gone to a, a very high elevation, you have to kind of acclimate to the the lower um, the lower amount of oxygen. So I, I grew up in New York, pretty close to sea level. I went to grad school in Utah, about a mile um, of elevation. So there's much less oxygen there, and I'm a runner. So when I first started to run, um, I really had to go slow, especially with uh, anything that was uphill, just because I wasn't used to the the, the less amount of oxygen to breathe. So it was much more difficult for my body to sort of um, supply my, my muscles with oxygen. Um, but that's an acclimation because it took a couple of weeks and then I was kind of uh, kind of used to it, barely even noticed it. Um, whereas an adaptation is gonna be on a, a larger scale in the sense of it's gonna be related to a, a population as a whole rather than just one specific organism. And it's going to take a much, much longer amount of time. Um, so if we think about a, a polar bear, for example, we can think of adaptations in terms of behavioral, so how it acts, in, as well as physical, so sort of what it looks like. Um, and in terms of the, the polar bear, the, the behavioral adaptations is going to um, dig dens, so it's not exposing itself constantly just to the, the cold winds of the, uh, the North Pole. It's also going to be a very good swimmer uh, because it's going to need to uh, it's going to need to be able to swim and hunt uh, in order to um, catch the the food it needs to survive. And then the the physical adaptations, just looking at it, it's got the the white fur going to help blend it in with the the snow and the ice. Um, so that's going to make it easier for it to to sneak up on its prey. If we think about it, if we had a, a grizzly bear in the North Pole. Um, just in terms of the the appearance of it, it's going to be a lot easier for different organisms to see that that bear coming versus the the white fur of a polar bear. Um, and then in addition to that, uh, some things that are not quite as readily apparent, um, but the the polar bear does have a very thick layer of fat that helps it keep it warm, particularly when it, when it's swimming. Um, and then similarly, it's got small and round ears which help retain heat. Um, so all of these things are going to be ways that the the polar bear has adapted adapted to, to survive in that harsh environment of the, the North Pole. And then if we go back to the, the cactus, again, it's adapting in an entirely different environment. So it makes sense, and it's a completely, uh, I mean, this is a plant versus a, an animal, um, but it's an entirely different environment. So it's not gonna wanna adapt to, to the same sort of environment as a polar bear. We took a cactus with a, a large stem that can store water, thick waxy skin to reduce water loss through pores. These different um, adaptations that help it survive in the desert aren't gonna be useful if we then take it and transplant it to the, the polar region. Same thing vice versa, if we were to take a polar bear to the desert, wouldn't be um, a great time for that polar bear because its adaptations have allowed that species to survive in that specific environment. Uh, and then with the, the, the cactus as well, um, the spines on the, the cactus 
can offer protection from different organisms, but they also reduce the amount of water loss compared to if it had leaves on the plant. Um, and then the, the root system with cactus as well as other desert plants are gonna be similar to these, um, but they typically have um, wide, widespread root systems because the, the water is gonna be very, uh, very sparse and it's gonna be closer to the surface. So it can collect any of the, the rain that may come, um, whereas it's not gonna be super deep typically. Uh, and then with this process of adaptations, the, um, the man in the, the picture here, Charles Darwin, uh, may have heard that name before, wrote a book on um, how species change over the generations and came up with this term survival of the fittest. And with the survival of the fittest, again, it's kind of on a smaller scale. We're looking at competition between a small amount of organisms. And in terms of competition, we, we're meaning sort of um, a, a struggle for the, the resources in that area. Um, so survival of the fittest just means whatever individual is better equipped to better adapted for that environment, they're going to be more fit, which just means that they're going to be better able to survive. Um, with that, it doesn't necessarily mean physically the strongest. It could in some cases, if it's going to be sort of an actual battle between whatever those organisms may be. Um, but it just means whatever organisms has the, the better adaptations for whatever that, um, that environment may uh, require. And again, that's kind of on a smaller scale in terms of both time and the, the number of organisms. But when we see the survival of the fittest um, sort of repeat over and over again, throughout the, the generations, it's gonna consistently be the, the most fit that is gonna survive. And that uh, most fit organism is then gonna be able to pass its traits down onto the, the next uh, generation. And that's where we start to see natural selection occur. When we start to have generation after generation, and our, that's when we start to have evolution occur, I should say, um, natural selection is just gonna be the, the passing on those traits from the, this, the, the organism that does survive, the organism that is the, the most fit. And that allows those adaptations to then uh, sort of propagate throughout the generations. We'll see them repeat more and more throughout. Um, but if you're wondering sort of what causes these adaptations, um, the thing that's going to cause that is the, the same thing that allows them to be um, passed on. It's going to be the, the DNA. So these adaptations are often just a result of some sort of uh, mutation within the DNA. And this leads to some sort of error that leads to a, a different sort of representation of whatever that trait's going to be. And this actually happens a lot. But a lot of the times these errors, a lot of the times these mutations, um, as it says here, have no impact on fitness, meaning that they don't make that organism more or less likely to survive. But every once in a while, those mutations do um, do have an impact on the, the fitness of that organism. They're going to make it either better equipped for that environment. They're going to be able to um, better get food, better get the, the resources it needs, or it's going to make it worse. A mutation could be um, deadly. And in that case, it's going to have the, the reverse impact. We're going to see less of that, um, that trait occur. But these mutations are what are what are ultimately causing these different um, traits to occur. And then depending on if they're advantageous or not, we then may see them repeat throughout the 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 population. Um, and with Darwin, Charles Darwin, he was on the, the Galapagos Island looking at the, the finches. So if you look here, the um, main thing we're focused on is the the size and the shape of these beaks. Um, so all of these finches come from the same ancestor, as you can see kind of in the middle here. But then based on where they were located, based on the, the resources that were available in that, that spot, based on the, the competition that was there, they wound up adapting to have these different, um, different shaped beaks. And ultimately, uh, that's what we're going to be sort of thinking about in terms of natural selection and then ultimately evolution. So if we look at natural selection and action, as it says here, we've got a couple different examples. The, the top one, we're looking at giraffes and their, their longer necks. So what it's showing is we've got one giraffe with a, a very long neck, and we've got some of them with the, the shorter ones. 
there's going to be more competition between the, the resources of these shorter ones, and they may not even be able to get the, the leaves off of this tree. So what we're then going to see as we move forward into later generations is we're going to see the, the taller giraffe, the giraffe with the longer neck, is going to produce more often. So we're going to see less of the, the shorter neck giraffes, and ultimately, we'll probably just see the, the shorter neck giraffes actually kind of die out, and we'll just have the, the longer neck ones remaining. Similarly at the, similarly at the, the bottom, we've got um, an example with mice being hunted by some sort of predator bird. Um, and these mice, we've got two different colors. So we've got black, and then we've got kind of a, a beigeous brown. Um, and with the, the color of the landscape here, we can see the, the black uh, mice blend in very easily. So when we have a, a predator sort of flying above looking for food, it's gonna be tough for them to spot these black mice, but these beige mice stick out like a sore thumb. So they're gonna be very easy for this bird to spot, very easy for this bird to hunt. And that's what we're seeing in this second picture here. The bird was able to spot a lot of those beige mice, catch them and eat them, but the, the black mice were well protected. So then when we go forward, those black mice were able to reproduce. That's why we've got a much larger population in this, uh, this final frame. Whereas the, the beige mice went from six initially down to two, the black mice went from three up to, to seven. And obviously they're just kind of made up numbers here, but we can just see the, the general increase for the, the ones that blend in, the decrease for the ones that stick out. Um, so this is again, just showing that the advantageous traits are then able to be um, reproduced more and more throughout the, the later generations. And, <clears throat> excuse me, um, with natural selection, it's not just gonna happen um, anywhere there are sort of uh, some criteria we need to meet in order for this, this to occur. And again, it's gonna be a long, uh, well, natural selection, I guess, can happen relatively quickly. Uh, evolution, we'll see in a little bit, gonna be a longer process. Um, but in order for this to occur, we need a competition for the resources. If there's no competition for these resources or if there's plenty of resources for everything, every organism, there's not gonna be really any threat and every, so if we go back here, for example, um, in terms of competition for resources for these giraffe, if we think about it, if this tree had a bunch more branches here with a bunch more leaves, it wouldn't be, um, the shorter neck giraffes wouldn't really be dying out at all because they would have plenty of food in addition to the, the tall neck giraffe getting the, the food at the top. But in this case, because of the, the competition for the resources, that's why we see the, um, the short neck giraffe die out. Similarly, if there wasn't any um, predator here, there'd be no reason for the uh, beige mice to be getting hunted. So there wouldn't be any competition in that sense. Um, and then they would be able to continue to reproduce as well. So we need some sort of competition to um, sort of limit the, the population a little bit so that there is a reason for the, the advantageous traits to uh, reproduce more often, more frequently. Um, <clears throat> and then we need a variation among the population. So if you think about it, again, going back here, if we just had one type of draft, just long neck or short neck, there wouldn't be any advantage there. So we would see um, ultimately just the, the population reach a limit where only that amount can survive rather than seeing one type of draft sort of preferentially survive over another. Um, so we do need to have that variation there. Same thing down here. If we didn't have, uh, if we only had one type of mouse, so either brown or black, there wouldn't be that variation for natural selection to occur. Again, we're seeing the, the black mice reproduce more frequently as we go on because it blends in. But if it was just black or brown and there wasn't this mix here, there wouldn't be the, the even the option for that, that natural selection to occur because we would just have that one thing. Um, Third, the, the traits of the parents are inherited by the, the offspring. So again, this is just sort of the, the standard reproduction where the, the traits are passed on to the offspring. And what this allows is for the, as we see here, for the, the black mice that survive to pass on their traits more frequently than the, the brown mice that were, were hunted more, uh, more often. Same thing with the, the giraffes up here. If the, the length of the neck of a giraffe wasn't something that could be passed on genetically, um, then it wouldn't be something that can uh, 
show up in natural selection really. And then finally, the, the population must be isolated. This just means that um, in terms of who they're reproducing with, there's not going to be any sort of uh, outside effect coming in. And then sort of related to that, the, the population has to be random. If we were observing some sort of population and then we're dictating as sort of like some sort of weird experiment, which mice or which giraffe are going to uh, mate and reproduce, then that wouldn't be natural selection because we would be the one sort of directing uh, directing that outcome. And then, like I was saying, natural selection, survival of the fittest, evolution are all kind of the same idea. It's just depending on the, the scale we're looking at in terms of the, the number of organisms as well as the, the length of time. Um, the survival of the fittest, we can kind of think of as just a um, that organism versus another organism. So in this case, we've got, it looks like some sort of I don't know, worm or something, green versus purple. Uh, and in this case, it's going to be similar to the, the mice situation where the ones that blend in with the background better are going to be able to survive. Um, so in this case, if we look at these two, we would expect the, the green one to survive more often. Natural selection is the same exact idea. It's just now in this case, we're looking at the, the population as a whole rather than just these two organisms. Uh, but it's the same idea. When we look at these population as a whole, we've got four green, four purple. We would still expect the, the green to survive more often, to pass on their traits more often then accordingly. Um, so when we get to evolution, it's basically just these two ideas just continuously rolled on for an extre uh, extremely long period of time. So we can actually see the um, the change in the, the species itself. And sometimes it actually will result in a, a new, um, but that's why we're seeing in the, the evolution after a long period of time, we've got green and then we've got a, a slightly different color green because what's gonna happen is over time, over generations, the, the green are basically gonna essentially um, just take over the entire population because the purple ones are going to be more easily spotted, more easily hunted, whatever it's going to be. They're going to be less likely to survive. So we'll see the green trait produced uh, or reproduced more often. And then what we're seeing here actually is if you look, we've got two different slightly colored green colors here because what we could have is then within these uh, original green ones, there could be another mutation where it changes it to this, this different green one where maybe now that one's even more likely to survive. So over an even longer period of time, maybe we'll see the uh, this lighter green one sort of take over, but it's just the, the idea where advantageous traits are gonna be able to reproduce and then pass on throughout the, the generations. Okay. Um, And then somewhat related with the, the ability of a um, of an organism to survive is just based on um, where that, that organism is located. And that's going to be determined uh, based on what are known as limiting factors. So if we think about just things like moisture, light, temperature, pH, nutrient levels, particularly for plants, um, there's always going to be these sets of conditions where that organism can or cannot survive. And it's especially with plants. So, you know, um, certain tropical plants aren't going to be able to survive in the, the polar region, vice versa, uh, because they're, they've are they adapted for those specific environments. Um, and once these limiting factors get, without, get outside of a, a certain range, that's when we start to see... Um, start to see that organism no longer thrive and then no longer survive. Um, and in addition to sort of environmental factors, like I mentioned, um, this can also be related to um, resource allocation. So if we have to, if that organism has to compete with other species, that's gonna be a limiting factor because there's gonna be less resources available. It may need to just go somewhere else to survive. Um, and then similarly, um, uh, predation. So just being hunted, uh, even if it's a parasite as well, disease, just something that's going to, um, something that could kill that, that organism. Those are all gonna be the, the limiting factors that determine where something, uh, where a species is gonna live.
And then with these, um, all of these limiting factors, there's going to be one that's going to be sort of the, the closest to the, the sort of the threshold that that animal can, can handle. And that's going to be what's known as the, the critical factor. So the one that's sort of the, the most important. Um, so for example, freezing temperatures prevent cactuses from surviving in the, the colder north. Um, they would be able to probably handle the, the light, handle the moisture, but the, the temperature is going to be the big one there. Um, again, those other factors probably not going to be ideal, but the, the temperature one is going to be the, the most important. So that's why for a cactus, we would consider it to be the, the critical one. Um, and depending on the organism, it could be pH, temperature, light, whatever it's going to be. Um, and depending on the environment, even, uh, could differ. Uh, but with these limiting factors, you can kind of think of it like we have here. So with the environmental factor, it could be any of those ones we just listed. Um, so if we think about it in terms of temperature, it could have a high temperature, low temperature, and then on the, the y-axis, it's showing how many um, how many of that organism could survive uh, at that point. So if we've got sort of a medium temperature, that's going to be, that could be what's known as the, the optimal range. And of course, these temperatures are going to vary depending on the, the organism. So an optimal zone in terms of temperature for humans, going to be different than a polar bear. Um, but this optimal zone is going to be sort of the, the best range for whatever that factor is going to be. That's where the organism wants to live. And that's going to be where most of them do. Um, outside of that range, on both sides, so if we can think temperature, it could be a little colder, a little warmer. The organism could still probably survive, but it's not going to be ideal. We've got the zone of stress. And then even further outside those, we get to, to very freezing or very, very hot. Um, that's going to be zone of intolerance where that, that organism can no longer survive. And um, with these different environmental factors, um, they can be, in some cases, difficult to actually measure, um, or it can just be costly and time consuming. It just might not be very feasible to do, especially in a lot of locations. Um, so what they can do is use what are known as indicator species. And these uh, essentially help sort of monitor the environmental conditions for that area. Um, so one example I have listed here, trout um, require cool, clean, and oxygenated water. So if there are trout present, that's going to be typically a good indicator of the, the water quality. If there are no tr if trout start dying off, probably going to be a good sign that the, the water quality is uh, diminished. And there are a whole bunch of different examples like this. Um, one example from when I was in grad school, um, my advisor worked with somebody in environmental toxicology that was measuring the concentration of a certain pesticide in water uh, because they wanted to identify sort of if this, I think it was a mayfly, if that would be a good indicator species. So they wanted to see sort of the, the range at which the, the mayfly, how it sort of behaved. So it could then be used as an indicator species. Um, so there's a whole bunch of different ones. So like I said, the trout, the, the mayfly, if there's um, no mayflies in the, the water in New Zealand, I think they can kind of use that to, to gauge the, the pesticide concentration. Um, but it's basically just using the, the presence of a species to determine the, the quality of the, the environment. And then um, with these environments, we refer to the, the habitat, sometimes just the, the ecosystem as a whole. Um, that's going to be the, the place where the, the organism lives. Um, but with these organisms, we're also going to see that they have a, a function within those environments. And that's what we're going to refer to as the, the niche, the, the niche, as some people call. I don't know exactly which one is correct, but I'm going to say, um, probably say niche, I guess. Um, but like I said, this is going to be describing the, the role that that that's, uh, species actually plays in that organism. Uh, so if we just look at the, the left here, or the right here, excuse me, um, habitat, the place or part of an ecosystem, the, the physical place reflects the living place of an organism, whereas the, the niche, the role, function, or activity reflects the biotic and abiotic. So that's just referring to um, living and non-living association with the environment. Um, so it's just sort of what it does in that area rather than just the, the area itself.
Um, and depending on the, the organism, the, uh, the niche, the size of it can vary. So what we're looking at on this graph here um, is the, the resource use on the, the x-axis, number of individuals on the, the y. So the, the larger that resource use is on the, the bottom, that means the, the more areas, the um, larger set of conditions that that organism can survive in. And then the the distance, or the and then I should say the the narrower the the band is just the the more specific of an area that that organism has to live in. Um, and then what they're showing here at the top, the distance between those, the niche separation as they're calling it, just represents the the difference in the roles that those two organisms play. So if we had these two overlapped, that means they would be occupying the, the same niche. There'd be a lot of competition between those two organisms, but because they're separate. That means they they sort of serve different roles in the ecosystem, um, but again the 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 width of these bands. Um, so the the raccoon is a generalist. That's why it's got a much larger um, peak to or broader peak, I should say, um, because it's able to to survive in a larger range of conditions. So if you've seen raccoon, they um, they'll rummage through trash and just survive that way, whereas the <coughs> um, Panda bear, um, much more specialist, can only survive in a, a, a narrow range of conditions. And that's why we're seeing a, uh, a shorter band there. And like I was saying, with the separation here, they serve different roles. If we had those overlapped, they'd be serving the, the same role. And that would be known as, um, sometimes known as complete competitors were the principle of competitive exhaustion. And in that case, they're not gonna be able to serve those identical roles for very long. Um, eventually one of them is sort of gonna take uh, precedent over the other in that, that er uh, area. And what that's gonna mean is they'll take a, uh, a dominant share of the resources. So that other organism is then gonna have to adapt in some way, they're gonna have to move, um, they're gonna have to change how they, how they live or they're essentially just going to die out. Um, and with this, one example is just in terms of uh, moving is just pretty simple that they're just going to move somewhere else where there's less competition, where they can thrive a little bit easier. Um, but some examples of changing include things like resource partitioning. Um, so in this case, we're calling it the, the losing species because it had to develop a new niche. Um, so an example of that is swallows and bats both eat flying insects. But there's no competition between the two really because they hunt at different times. So swallows fly around during the day, bats fly around more in the, the evening and the nighttime. So they're not competing for those same resources. Similarly, there's some organisms that live in um, like forests and live in trees and um, they actually occupy different levels of the canopy. So even though they're located pretty much right on top of each other because they're in different sections of the trees, they're not competing over those same resources. Um, Otherwise, again, this would be the, the competition and one of them would just wind up uh, ultimately not having enough resources to survive. And then speciation, we talked about a little bit with the, the Galapago finches. Um, it's essentially just a development of a new species because of those adaptations. So it goes through an entire population and then because it comes uh, so adapted for whatever that niche is gonna be, um, it's just classified as a, a new species. And then when this occurs in different areas, like with the, the different finches, they were located on different islands, different sections, um, that's allopatric speciation. And then if it's occurring in the, the same geographic area and we wind up with different species that way, um, would just be sympatric speciation. But again, both of them are going to wind up with uh, new species that are adapting to those new niches. Um, and if it's sympatric, that's going to be them changing uh, sort of like what they do, essentially. They're going to have to adapt a, a new beak, a new, um, some sort of new adaptation to better survive in that environment. And then with these adaptations, with this natural selection, we've seen it with the... 
um, that example with the giraffe, the example with the, the mice being hunted. Um, but with this, there's what's known as selective pr selection pressure. And what it is, is essentially describing what type of mutation, what type of um, trait is going to be more advantageous in that um, that situation. We're going to have um, stabilizing selection. We're going to have disruptive selection, and we're going to have directional selection. So they're all going to be forms of natural selection, but the sort of the the type of trait that they promote, the type of trait that becomes more advantageous, is going to be different between the the different types of pressure. So with this first one, we're looking at stabilizing selection reduces variation in a trait. The extremes are advantageous for survival. So the examples I have here, birth weight. Um, so when we think about a stabilizing selection, what we're going to see is that the, the trait that's going to become dominant is going to be sort of an average trait. So the reason that birth, uh, birth weight of babies is a good example is because typically when babies are born, they're all generally in a very similar range. I forget exactly what it is, but it's like six pounds to nine pounds, maybe nine pounds may even be a little heavy, but um, I don't know much about babies, but whatever the range is, most babies are, are pretty close to that range. But when they start getting outside of that range, that can be when sort of problems start to arise. Um, so my sister-in-law just had a, um, had a baby in uh, June and then the, the baby was like two pounds baby's fine, but ultimately that lo much lower weight was a problem. Um, so with stabilizing selection, the, the average trait is just sort of a um, a better option. That's why we see the, the average rather than an extremely heavy baby or an extremely um, light baby. Uh, so with stabilizing selection, we're going to see an average trait sort of become the, the most dominant. Um, the, the next one, we're going to look at directional. In this case, we're not going to see the, the average trait reproduce or get reproduced more often. What we're going to see is one extreme is going to be favored over another. Um, so that this could be an example like with the, the giraffes. The, the long neck giraffe wound up surviving over the, the short neck giraffe or the medium neck giraffe. Um, another example, I have here a drought limited availability of small seeds on the island. So large build finch, uh, large build finches survived more often. Um, so with the, the lack of small seeds, meaning that there was only larger seeds on the island, only the, the finches with larger bills were able to um, get food. So they were the only ones that were able to survive. They were the only ones that were able to reproduce. And that's why they would see the, on this island, we would see a shift towards large billed finches. So with the, the directional pressure, we're only going to see one extreme. So that's why we only see large build finches. We don't see large and small now. So with directional, we're pushing it just towards one extreme. And then the, the final one, disruptive. This one, we're going to see either or extreme. We're going to see both of them, but we're not going to see much of the, the average trait being present. Um, and a good example of this one is going to be with oysters. Um, so with oysters, they're sitting at the, the bottom of the water. Um, and if they're light colored oysters, they're going to blend in with the rocks. If they're dark colored oysters, they're going to blend in with the shadows. So both of those are going to help protect the oysters. But if they're sort of an average of those two, if they're a medium color, that's going to make them visible in both scenarios. So that's going to be completely, um, disadvantageous. So the, the oysters are going to want to either be very light colored or very dark colored. So they're going to get pushed to one or extreme, one extreme or the other, but they're not going to favor the, the average. So with disruptive selection, we're going to see sort of a gap in the um, the traits. We're going to see, if we're thinking about this visually, a lot of stuff on the left, a lot of stuff on the right, but nothing in the, the middle. Um, and what we can do is actually look at these graphs. So what it's showing here in each case is this red line, and it's the same red line in all three of them. Um, X is representing the sort of the trait itself. So we can think about the left side as being one extreme, the right side being another, and then the middle just kind of being the average. So that's why we're seeing sort of a bell curve with the red line 
we're seeing mostly have an average trait. And as we get further away from it in either direction, we're seeing that trait become less and less common. Um, but then with the, the blue curve, we're seeing what's happening after natural selection occurs. So take a minute to see if you can identify which of these is going to be directional, which of these is going to be stabilizing, and which of these is going to be disruptive. So one of these is representing each of those. And again, it's going from the, the red line to showing what the blue is in that population after natural selection. So take a minute on your own. You may want to pause it just to give yourself a second to think, because I'm going to kind of just go into this one. Uh, but if we look at it and go piece by piece again from red to blue, in this first one, we're moving from sort of an average straight and we're pushing it all the way to the right. And since we're only pushing it in that one direction, this is going to be our directional pressure. The second one, we kind of wind up with a similar sort of distribution. It's just even more tight. So we're still winding up with the, the average basically in the same spot. It's just the extremes are getting even less um, less common. So this would be our stabilizing. So this is similar to the, um, the birth weights. We're gonna have most babies are gonna be sort of that average birth uh, weight. And we may have a few that are kind of off to the side, but we're not gonna have a, a broad range like we did with the, the red one. Um, and then finally, that means the third one would be our disruptive selection, because again, we're losing some of that average trait we're seeing a decrease there, and we're getting more of the extreme on the left. We're also getting more of the extreme on the right. So this would be similar to the, the oysters, where we're going to have um, light-colored oysters that are going to be fine. They're going to survive. We're going to have dark-colored oysters. Those are going to survive. So we're going to see both of those traits become more present. Um, but those medium-colored oysters, where they're going to be visible in every scenario, we're not going to see as many of those just because that trait's not going to be um, as advantageous those oysters aren't going to survive, aren't going to reproduce as often. So again, first one directional because it's just going to that one side. Two is stabilizing because it's getting more of that average trait, um, making everything sort of the, the same. And then the, the third one disruptive because we're pushing it in both directions there. Okay. And then uh, so species interactions, we can think of this in two ways. Um, intraspecific and interspecific competition. So just like intrastate and interstate, intra with the RA is referring to within. So an intrastate is a, a road that travels within one state. So intraspecific competition is going to be competition between the, the same species, whereas interspecific, just like the interstate, goes between multiple states, this is going to be competition between various species. It could be two different species, it could be more, but they're just going to be different. Um, and the, the way to reduce competition within one species, so if we're thinking about intraspecific, um, the, the young can disperse to new territory, can become extremely territorial to force the offspring and others out of the area. Um, or we can have the adults and juveniles occupy different niches. So if they're doing two different things, they're serving two different roles could be complementary. They're not going to be competing with one another. Um, but if they are, there's going to be some sort of either the, the young are just going to kind of move off and find their own place, do their own thing, um, or there's going to be some sort of territorial standoff. And that could also be between uh, two adults, um, whatever it's going to be, but there's going to be some sort of competition there. And then um, with interspecific, we've got predator-prey relationships a lot of the time. So again, predator is hunting the, the prey. Um, and this is naturally going to lead to um, what's known as co-evolution. As long as the, the predator and the prey, one of them doesn't just go completely extinct. Um, but this is going to lead to co-evolution in the, the sense that if the, the prey or the predator adapts in some way, the other one is going to have to adapt to, to sort of counteract that a little bit. So if we think about just a cheetah and a gazelle, a cheetah hunts gazelles. Um, the, the cheetah is extremely fast in a sprint, so over a short distance, a short period of time, the cheetah is going to be extremely, extremely fast. But the, the, the gazelle doesn't quite have the same top end speed, but it's going to be able to go at a um, 
go for a much longer distance, a much longer time. So if you can kind of avoid that initial burst from the cheetah, the gazelle is going to get away. But if the cheetah can sort of pounce on the gazelle right away, it's got it. Um, and that's going to be an example of a, a co-evolution because as the, the cheetah developed more and more speed, the gazelle is going to de uh, develop more and more endurance. And then there are a bunch of examples like this where whatever the, the prey does to um, avoid the, the predator, the predator then has to adapt to to try to counteract that and get the, the prey again. And then the prey has to develop another way. So with these co-evolution, that's kind of what we're thinking about. Um, these adaptations occurring in tandem between two different species. And then a little bit of a, a similar idea, but not totally the, the same, is what's known as Batesian mimicry. And I think this is a, a pretty cool thing. Um, you may be familiar with the, the, the saying um, when it comes to snakes, red touch black, safer jack, red touch yellow, kill a fellow. Um, and that's in reference to the, the snakes in this picture here. So the, the coral snake and the, the king snake, if you look, very similar. They both got red. The yellow is a little bit different, but it's kind of orangey in this coral snake, but it's basically the same. And then they have black. The, the width and the stuff of these bands is different. But if you look at them, two reasonably similar snakes. Um, but if you look at them closely, on the, the king snake, the red touches the, the black bands. Whereas on the, the coral snake, the red touches the, the yellow bands. That's how we can kind of distinguish these two. Um, and that's an important distinguish, uh, distinguishment to make because the, the coral snake, the one on the left here, is venomous. So if it bites you, it's going to, um, I'm not sure how venomous, but I would assume if you don't get treated, you'll probably die. Um, you might just be feeling bad for a while, but I would assume probably worse than that. Whereas the, the king snake, not venomous at all. And that's going to be important for the, the king snake because if another organism comes along and knows the, the coral snake is poison, if, if it's something that that species has learned over time to avoid the, the coral snake, because if it comes near us and it bites us, if we die, that's going to be something that those spe that species is going to learn over time. So if it knows the, the coral snake is venomous and then it sees this king snake, it's going to see that this snake is very similar. It's going to want to avoid it. So the Batesian mimicry helps a, a harmless species resemble a poisonous one. Um, another example of this occurs with uh, butterflies. Um, some of the, the butterflies are poisonous if they, they get eaten. So if something eats the, the butterfly, it'll make them sick. Other butterflies that look very similar to those poisonous butterflies, but aren't uh, poisonous at all. But again, it's just sort of this mimicry where they look similar enough that the, the other organisms are just going to avoid it because they don't want to risk um, potentially getting bit by the, the venomous one or potentially eating the, the poisonous one. It's going to be sort of a defense that these species have uh, adapted when there wasn't really anything else they could do to protect themselves. And again, this is going to be an adaptation that takes a, a long time. Um, it's going to be some sort of mutation that's going to make it more advantageous in terms of the, the survival of that organism, which is then going to allow that to be... Um, that trait to be passed on to, to reproduce more often. And then a little bit of a different idea. Um, instead of sort of mimicking a different organism, sometimes we actually see organisms cooperate and then sometimes that cooperation isn't always beneficial to, to both of them, but we're gonna refer to this as symbiosis. So two or more species living closely together in tandem. I see a picture here of, looks like a, uh, gazelle maybe, some sort of deer-like creature, and then a bird. Um, this could be an example of commensalism, or actually this could be an example of mutualism, where maybe the, the bird um, cleans the other animal and then eats the, the insects off of it. So the, the bird gets fed, the other animal gets cleaned. That happens a lot of the times with um, like crocodiles and alligators have birds on them that do the, the same thing. Um, I think there's even sharks where the, the fish kind of come around and clean their teeth. Um, but this is going to be, all of those would be examples of mutualism because both of the species involved are benefiting. So again, in the example of cleaning the, the animal, the bird gets fed, the other organism um, gets cleaned. Commensalism, we'll see a few of those on the, the next slide. This is going to be where one of them benefits and the other one 
just isn't affected really at all. Um, so on the, the next slide, there's going to be a couple examples. One of them is going to be just the, uh, the tree frog um, that uses plants just as cover to hide from predators. So the, the frog is helped by getting protected, but the plant itself isn't helped or harmed in any way. Um, and then the, the third type we're going to look at is parasitism. And this one, not really too much to say about it. Um, if you're familiar with the term parasite, pretty self-explanatory. It's just going to be um, some sort of symbiosis where the, the one organism benefits at the expense of another. So if you think about ticks, fleas, tapeworms, they're all examples of parasites because they're feeding off the host. And then the host is being harmed during this process. If a tick could bite you and it didn't affect you at all, then that would be a sign of commensalism, but because it's parasitism, or it's parasitism because um, it's sucking out your blood and then it can also um, potentially make you sick if it's got, uh, if it like transfers uh, the Lyme disease uh, to you and things like that. Same thing with fleas and tapeworms. Um, anything where that organism benefits at the expense of the host is gonna be an example of parasitism. So you can even think of things like viruses as uh, sort of parasitism if you want. Uh, but like I said, here are just a couple examples of commensalism because I think that's sort of probably the one that gets overlooked the most because the with mutualism, sometimes that one can be kind of cute. So you may see videos of different animals helping each other. Uh, parasitism can usually be kind of gross. So I think some people kind of focus on that one. Commensalism, just kind of a little bit boring. But like I said, the, the tree frog, uses plants for protection. Um, in the second one, the, the cattle, as it's feeding on the, the grass, is actually going to stir up different uh, insects. And then the egret is just going to sort of eat those insects as they pop up. And then the golden jackal is sort of a, uh, a scavenger almost. It's going to follow packs of tigers around. Or not follow packs of tigers. It's going to follow a tiger around. Um, and then sort of just whatever is left behind like I said, kind of a scavenger, kind of a vulture almost, just sort of pick at what remains. And again, all these are commensalism because the, the frog, the egret, the, the jackal are all benefiting, but the, the tiger, the cattle, and the, the plants themselves aren't being benefited, aren't being harmed at all. Um, so it's kind of just a, a positive for one and then a, a neutral for the other. All right. And then um, we talked about food webs a little earlier, uh, chapter two, I think it was. Uh, yeah, chapter two. Um, and we saw sort of the, the connection between them, but we didn't really dive too deep into it at all. Um, we saw that primary consumers eat the primary producers, and then there's the carnivores even farther, farther up above that. Um, and all of those species are going to be important. If we remove one of those species, it's going to disrupt that food web. The more biodiversity there is in that food web, the more, the, the better able that ecosystem is going to be at handling that loss. But some of those species are more important than others. And those are what we refer to as keystone species. Um, and if we look at this example here, we're going to consider uh, sharks to be considered keystone species. So on the, the left-hand side, we've got just our, our regular ecosystem, and you can see sharks at the top. We've got the the, the rays in the middle, and then we've got our uh, different little critters at the, the bottom here. And everything's able to stay in balance because the, the shark keeps the, the ray population in check, and then the, the ray population keeps these bivalve and anthropod populations in check. Um, but the, the reason we consider some species to become, be considered keystone species is because if we remove that species, the entire food web is essentially going to crumble. And that's what we're showing on the right-hand side here. Um, so for whatever reason, it could be overfishing. Um, there could be a disease that maybe affects the, the shark, um, but typically it would be overfishing. Um, but it's going to essentially um, devastate that shark population. And without the, the shark population there, what we're going to see is there's nothing to keep the ray population in check. So those are going to increase. And as it says here, they're going to become overpopulated. And because of that, now they're going to overfeed 
on the, the bivalve and the anthropods, what we've got going on here. And that's why we see that population also become devastated. And now if we think about it, there's nothing at the bottom for the, the rays to feed on. Now they're gonna become, uh, they're, they're gonna have to go somewhere else entirely um, or they'll also just die out. So with these keystone species, these are just gonna be sort of uh, the, the most important species in those food webs. And if we remove them, the, the food web itself is going to disappear. It's going to fall apart. Um, and what I want to point out is a lot of the times the, the keystone species are focused on with things like sharks. Um, I think a lot of the times it's kind of interesting to, to focus on those apex predators. Um, but note that a keystone species doesn't necessarily have to be the, the top apex predator. It's just going to be the this, a species that's critical to the survival of that entire ecosystem. So um, another example of a keystone species would actually be the, the coral reef, because the, the coral reef provides such a large amount of services and just does so much for the, the ecosystem. So if we were to remove the, the coral reef, all of the organisms surrounding it, the, the ecosystem would just essentially fall apart. So with the, the keystone species, just think about importance in that food web rather than uh, it necessarily being the, the the top predator in that food web. Certainly can be the, the top predator, but it doesn't necessarily have to be. Um, but another example of a predator that is a, a keystone species is gonna be the, the jaguar. Um, so in the, the Amazon in Central and South America, um, the, the jaguar helps sort of keep the, the population of a whole bunch of other species in check. And the Amazon rainforest is one of the most biodiverse uh, locations on Earth. Um, so if we were to lose the, the jaguar, and there's other things going on there, we're talking about the, the deforestation as well. But the, the loss of a jaguar in particular in that area is going to affect the, the population of so many other prey species that um, the, the, the ecosystem as a whole is going to be dramatically changed if the, the jaguar was to go to, was to essentially be removed from that, that ecosystem. Um, and with these uh, species, with their, their populations, we can think about the, the growth in a couple different ways. So on the left, we've got exponential growth, kind of look like a, a J. And then on the, the right, we've got logistic growth. Um, and then you're seeing here what's known as the, the carrying capacity. That's just referring to sort of the, the the highest population that that environment can support given the the amount of resources available um yeah so like i was saying um when the the population exceeds that carrying capacity so if we think about it that's this dotted line is the amount of organisms for whatever that population is going to be um that can survive given the amount of resources. So if we have the population just shoot up way above that, now we've exceeded the, the carrying capacity. There's not enough resources for these additional organisms to survive. So that's why we start to see what's called dieback. We see the, the population plummet because now there's not enough resources. So a lot of these organisms are gonna die from starvation or malnutrition. And we see it decrease and decrease and decrease until eventually we get below the the carrying capacity, we're always going to overshoot it by a little bit just because it takes a little bit of time for the, the population itself to respond. Um, and then once we get back below it again, there's enough resources for all of those organisms so we can have the, the population go back up. And again, we're going to overshoot it. And then eventually, hopefully, we'll get to a point where the, the population is stable and it's in a, a spot where the, the resources can support that constant population. Um, I should also note that the, the carrying capacity of its, the environment itself isn't constant. Um, so it can change just without the, throughout the year based on resource availability. It can also change over time based on things like climate change, based on things like habitat destruction. Um, so the things humans do can actually cause the sort of where this dotted line would be to increase or decrease. And then this one we talked about a little bit uh, previously, but again, we're just seeing the, the hare and the lynx population. So a predator prey relationship where um, as one of them goes up, the other one's gonna go 
uh, up as well. Well, I guess as the the hair population goes up, then the the predator lynx population will increase, um, which then causes the the hair to go down. So we're just seeing the the back and forth there. Um, sort of related to the the carrying capacity. Not exactly the same thing though. And then like I was saying, um, the exponential growth, the J-shaped one, is typically what a population is going to start out as. But as we approach that carrying capacity, um, ideally, we would then transition to what's known as, or uh, whoops, I screwed those up, the exponential growth, J-shaped. Um, but as we approach that, that carrying capacity, if we wanted to make sure that those that population can survive, we would want to make sure, hopefully, that the, the population growth becomes logistic so it approaches that carrying capacity rather than if we continued with an exponential growth like we saw in the, the previous ones, we shoot right past that carrying capacity, which results in starvation and malnutrition. Um, and then with this logistic growth equation, um, looks complicated. We're not going to be doing too much with it. But what I want to point out is these R and K because they're going to come up on the, the next uh, next slides. Um, this is just referring to the, the change in a population over time. So DN over DT, change in population over time. Um, and R is the, the, the rate of reproduction. K is just the, the carrying capacity. Um, this is going to be different for every different organism. And depending on what the, the organism is, uh, R or K are going to be different values. Depending on which one of these are bigger is going to be kind of dependent on how that organism reproduces. So again, R is the, the reproduction rate, essentially. K is the, the carrying capacity. So when we look at animals that are R, what are known as R-selected organisms, so just to go back, they're focused more on the, the growth rate themselves. These are going to be, or the reproduction rate, I should say. These are going to be animals like we're showing in the, the green line here, where they're essentially going to rely on a high rate of reproduction, knowing that the, the, the offspring is going to be very limited in terms of how many survive. Um, and that's what we're showing here with the, the green one, like I said. So they're using an example of, uh, it looks like an acorn tree. So if you think about a tree, um, it's going to release hundreds, if not thousands, of acorns or pine cones, whatever it's going to be. And that's why initially we've got a whole bunch of survivors because there's going to be a, um, actually it really shouldn't be, um, but that's why we see it decrease initially pretty fast because there's not going to be many of that population that actually survives. So every thousand acorns, how many of them do you think are actually going to turn into to trees? So that's why we see this decrease pretty quickly. So these are considered R selected organisms because they're going to rely mostly just on a high rate of reproduction. And it's basically just a numbers game. They're throwing out a whole bunch of um, whole bunch of options, just hoping that a couple of them are going to be successful. K selected organisms are ones that are more dependent on the, the carrying capacity. So those are going to be things like humans, things that don't rep reproduce nearly as often but they're gonna be more successful in that production in the sense that, um, like you can see it decreases because obviously not everybody's gonna to live to the, the same old age, but typically when people are born, most of them are gonna go through a relatively similar life, uh, life expectancy sort of thing. So that's why we see a pretty, pretty flat line here until the, the very end when we reach old age. Um, and then sort of in between would be an average of the two. And that's where we're seeing things like birds. Um, they have quite a few eggs, but not nearly as much as acorns, not as few as humans with babies. Um, and that's why it's kind of just in, in between there. And then with the, the rest of the chapter, um, just because this is a bit of a longer one, um, I'm not gonna go into those two final sections in this video here. Um, I do want you to read those sections though. And if you have any questions on them, please definitely let me know. Um, and we can either, uh, during office hours, you can come stop by whenever if those work for you. Uh, 
Um, I can also set up a Zoom at any point if those office hours don't work for you. You just obviously have to, to let me know that. And then uh, we can definitely get that going for any point.